D1v1 equals C2v2 is one of the most helpful things I can share with you. You might have heard it, M1v1 equals M2v2, um, because it, often the C for the concentration is given in terms of molarity, but it can really be in terms of anything, including chocolate chips per cup. So let's start with the fun example, um, and then we'll get into more uh, realistic things like making buffers. But using the C1v1 equals C2v2 formula, uh, super duper helpful formula, super duper simple, um, but so, so, so helpful. C1v1 equals C2v2. The C stands for concentration. So we have our initial concentration, then our B is volume. We multiply our initial concentration by our initial volume. And this value is going to be equal to our final concentration times the volume volume. So this is really, really useful if we have con solutions that are, or stocks that are more concentrated than we want to actually have them in our final solution. So we'll have some sort of final where we have a higher volume, um, a lower concentration, and so we want to often figure out, okay, well, how much of this stock solution do I need in order to get to this final um, working concentration that we want? So often we're using it in that sense, but we can also, as we'll see, solve for different components as long as we just rearrange the formula um, to isolate whichever one is unknown um, and then exchange. So we stick in the known factors, replace these like placeholders with actual numbers and then map it out. So solve it for the unknown. Um, and so just by stock solution, basically that's just a more concentration version of the solution that you actually want to work with. Um, so say you might want to make a solution of tris, so this buffer at like one molar um, sodium chloride, um, you might want to keep like five, or sorry, you might want to keep like tris at one molar, um, like a sodium, make a stock solution of sodium chloride at five molar. So often in biochemistry, we make these like higher concentration solutions, and then we dilute them down to our final like working concentration. By starting with these original stocks, um, we can have a higher concentration, which allows us to have like less liquid um, filling up all our shells. And it also allows us to inhibits bacterial growth and stuff, having it at a higher concentration. And importantly, it allows us to mix um, different solutions and then we have extra room to add in what else we want to put in there and we'll fill it up to the extra volume. And so we'll look at a more fun example in a minute. Um, but I kind of just jumped into molarity without really explaining it. So this molarity, this is where the M comes from. And when you see this formula written as M1V1 equals M2V2, which is actually how I learned it. Um, so molarity is just a unit of concentration. And we use it a lot in biochemistry because it's really helpful. It talks about the number in terms of number of, of copies of things as opposed to like just like the weight of things or that sort of thing. Um, and so a mole is like the biochemist does except that instead of 12, it's six times 10 to the 23rd of copies of something. And so when we say like a one molar solution, that means we have six times 10 to the 23rd moles of that thing in a liter. Um, and often, so when we're talking about these like high concentration stock solutions of salts and buffer components. Those are sometimes in the molar, molar range, but often we're dealing with um, at least for our working concentrations are gonna be things down in the milli, so like thousands or micro um, millionth and that sort of thing. Um, but we can use this equation for more than just molarity, which is why this more um, generic form is often used of the equation. Even though I learned it like this, this one's a little more helpful because we can use this concentration in any form of concentration as long as it's consistent between the sides. So this can be say percent weight volume or percent volume volume, as long as the same is on each side. It can even be chocolate chips per cup. Um, so let's look at a fun example, and then we'll look into a more practical example, as well as how we can apply this to um, serial dilutions. But first, let's start off with some little bit of fun. So say we want to make chocolate chip cookies with chocolate chip almond cookies. So we can use this equation to figure out the amount we need to add of each of the different components. And so we're going to do this separately for the chocolate chips and for the almonds. Um, so say we want to make a cup of dough that has 50 chocolate chips per cup and 10 almonds per cup. And I just kind of made up some numbers, but say that these will be like our stock solutions, just like the, the concentrated version. Um, and so we have 100 chocolate chips per cup and 50 almonds per cup. So these are gonna be our initial concentrations. Then we know our final desired concentrations. 
We know um, our desired final volume. We know that we want that one cup of dough, but we need to figure out our initial volumes. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna do this by rearranging, then exchanging and mathing it out. So we take the values, we write out what we know and we plug it in to this formula. And we, after we are rearranged to isolate the thing that we want to find. And so we want to find this V1C, the vo initial volume of your cookies, or sorry, of your chocolate chips. So we rearrange in terms of this, and then we see, we plug in our numbers and we math it out. And we see that, okay, we need to add half a cup of chocolate chips. Now, what about our nuts? We can do the exact same thing. Um, and so here, instead of C1C, we have C1N because now we're talking in terms of nuts. We do the exact same type of thing though. And in this case, we get, we have 0.2 cups of almonds. Um, so we put it all together. We need to now add our batter to volume. And so when you're making a solution, this will typically be adding water to volume. But in this case, we'll talk about the batter. So just like the plain batter mixture. Um, and so our final volume is going to be made up of the initial volume from the chocolate chips and the initial volume from the nuts, plus the initial volume of the batter. Um, and so we can now solve for this initial volume of the batter. And so we subtract that from, so we take that to V2, we know that our V2 is gonna be a cup, and we subtract the half a cup of chocolate chips and the 0.2 cup of nuts, and we see that we need to add 0.3 cups of our plain batter. And that's the way the cookie hopefully doesn't crumble. But oh no, you dumped too many chips in your dough? So say that you wanted to make um, your chocolate chip cookies to have 50 chocolate chips per cup, but you accidentally put in 75 chips. Don't worry, you can then just adjust the final volume and make more. Um, and so yeah, I, this is often a something that might happen in the lab if you accidentally add too much of one of the one of the components and then all hope might not be lost. Hopefully the, everything was really cheap um, and you can just make a little more without any problem. Um, but you need to know how much you put in um, and then you need to figure out, well, how much more do you need to add of the other stuff? So what's our final volume need to be now? So we can do the same sort of thing, but here we're solving for V2. So to solve to V2, we're going to um, divide the C1V1 divided by C2. Um, and so we can plug in, okay, we have 75 chips per cup as our initial volume, our initial concentration. And then our final concentration, we still want it to be 50 chips per cup. Um, and we, our initial volume now is gonna be one cup and our V2, now we figure out we need to have a cup and a half total. But don't just go adding half a cup of batter because we need to add more almonds too. If we were to just add the batter, then our almonds would be tightly dilute. So there are different ways that you could do this. You can do some more like complicated writing it out math wise. But I like to think, I find it easiest just to think in terms of you need 0.5 cups more volume. Um, and so you can do this whole equation. Now our new volume, final volume is going to be half a cup because that's like, this is in terms of what we're adding. So we can then rearrange and figure out, okay, well, we need to add 0.1 cup of almonds. And now we need to add batter to make up the difference. So here we're taking our um, V2, which is going to be our half a cup um, minus our V1, um, which is go of nuts, which is gonna be 0.1 cups. And we see that we need to have 0.4 cups of batter. I'm sorry, I hope this isn't confusing. I meant to put, I put the asterisk just in terms of that it's our new, our extra volume and not that we're actually like multiplying V2 by this, but our, instead our V2 is this 0.5 cups. Okay, um, so that was a fun example, but let's get a little more practical. Okay, so say we want to make a, um, make this buffer. So like this pH stabilized salt water. Um, and we want to make a buffer that has 10 millimolar tris of pH 8 and 100 millimolar NaCl. We want to make 250 mils of it. So as I mentioned, we like to keep these stock solutions of these things. So we say have one molar tris, pH 8, and five molar NaCl. These will be our stock solutions. 
And we had to figure out, okay, how much of the initial volume, how much of each of these do I need in order to make this final um, 250 mils of this working um, solution? So now we do the exact same thing. Um, and so if you want to try it out yourself, you can pause the video. If not, we're just going to move on. Do, 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 do. Okay. So basically, it's just exactly like we did before, except this case, we're using some more like practically soundy things. So we'll do everything in terms of the amount of tris that we need and the everything in the amount of sodium chloride that we need. And again, we need to make sure that we're converting the units so that they're consistent. Um, so we can talk in terms of we have this in, so we have our sodium chloride, like our working concentrations are in terms of millimolar, which is the thousandth of a molar. And so we need to convert these to molar because our stocks are in molar, or we need to convert our stocks to millimolar because our um, working solutions are in millimolar. So you can do it either way. Um, just make sure that you're consistent on each of the sides. And then we do this again, and we figure out how to make this solution. Um, so often when we're doing this in the lab, I like you can just do this in a graduated cylinder. So add the different components and then just fill to the water line. Um, fill the water up to the line where you want, um, making sure that you're looking at the bottom of the line, the meniscus, since when you're measuring. Okay, so we can also do use C1V1 equals C2V2. Um, take advantage of it when we're doing serial dilutions. And so a serial dilution is basically where you do the same dilution over and over and over. So you take something and say like you half it and you half that and you half that and half that and half that. These are really helpful if you want to cover a broad, broad range of concentrations and they're helpful so that you don't have as many um, pipetting errors and things if you need to get to a really low concentration. And so I have more on, more on serial dilutions and other posts. Um, but basically, because you're doing it this way, where you're like taking one and you're diluting it, and then you're using that diluted thing to make dilute another thing and then another thing. So in each case, your, your initial concentration is going to be coming from the concentration of the thing before it, multiplied by a dilution factor that we'll talk about. But basically, your C2, your first C2, well, now it's going to be the C1 of the next tube and so on and so on. Um, and so this dilution factor, basically this is, if you, it's how much are you diluting by each time? So if each dilution had, if you're halving something, then each dilution would have half the concentration of the prior one and your dilution factor would be two. If you were like thirding it, you would have a dilution factor of three. If you were quartering it, it would be a dilution factor of four, et cetera, et cetera. And you can multiply the very initial concentration. So instead of thinking, okay, this is the C1, or my C1 now is my C2 from before. Instead, you can just take that very, very original C1, multiply it um, by one over dilution factor. So this would be like one half, one third, one quarter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Multiplied um, to the number of to the raise the power of that dilution, um, and so this is really helpful when you're making solutions in the lab. Okay, so hope that was helpful and happy C1B1 equals C2B2ing.